Is it weird for you to know all of these people who like adore you? I know Melissa Etheridge said she was totally inspired by your music. I know Sean Colvin said you're the reason that she's a singer songwriter. Amidst the tribulations of existence, Joni Mitchell emerges as an indomitable force. Mitchell's journey weaves through heartaches, calamities, and disputes that would have shattered lesser spirits. Instead, these trials propelled and ignited a creative flame within her, birthing music that transcends temporal boundaries. What happened to her is more unimaginable than a tragic movie, and it's even harder to imagine when you know what she's doing in her ADS, all revealed in this video. In the annals of 1954, Roberta Joan Joni Anderson awoke to a reality where rising from her bed seemed an insurmountable challenge. Polio had seized her, unfurling its dire consequences. The adolescent found herself transported from her Alberta enclave to an urban clinic, where she not only bore witness to anguish, but confronted her mortality, all at the tender age of nine. Joni's limbs, intractable, painted a grim prognosis. However, she mounted a resolute counteroffensive. Through the passing weeks, she ascended from the remnants of her former self. Amidst absent parental visits, Joni ingeniously crafted solace from an imperfect familial canvas. She lent her voice to fellow patients, cultivating an affection for the art of performance. Simultaneously, Joni waged a relentless battle against polio, defying odds by standing up and walking, a feat that left onlookers astounded. This triumph catalyzed a lifetime marked by rebellion, though not always channeled towards judicious avenues. Joni Mitchell embodied a multitude of personas, and being excessively chick for academic conventions was one of them. The allure of grand destinies tugged at her from an early age, diverting her attention away from scholarly pursuits. Instead of immersing herself in textbooks, Joni found herself entangled with a dubious cohort, a choice that exacted its toll. Her academic record teetered on the edge, and securing admission to an art school was a narrow escape. A nonconformist even in matters of romance, Joni, the sole virgin in her school, sought to unravel the mysteries of passion. Enter Brad McMath Tall, blonde, a vision of dreams and effortlessly approachable. Their liaison was more a convenience than a quest for love, and both discovered something entirely unexpected. Embarking on a musical odyssey at the tender age of 20, Joni's outward narrative focused on her pursuit of music in Toronto. However, the unspoken chapters revealed a different reality. Wrestling with the challenges of a fledgling singing career, Joni also grappled with the complexities of an unforeseen pregnancy a consequence of her liaison turned father-to-be. Faced with the constraints of tradition, the duo sought refuge in the anonymity of the city, concealing the impending arrival of their conservative families. Yet, the urban expanse had its share of profound heartaches. When confronted with the impending responsibilities of parenthood, Joni exemplified resilience, a trait not mirrored by Brad. In a chilling response to the pressure, he chose the path of evasion, fleeing the country. Left to fend for herself and an unborn child, Joni's prospects dwindled with each passing day. The expanding swell of her belly mirrored the growing dread of an uncertain future. Contemplating the road ahead, all Joni envisioned was a panorama of suffering. Acknowledging the inevitable, she made a decision that continues to cast a haunting shadow over her existence. Following the birth of her daughter, Kelly Dale Anderson, Joni faced the heart-wrenching decision to place her in foster care. The echoes of Joni's personal history, marred by parental detachment and the poignant memories of the polio ward, intensified her anguish. Yet, within the depths of despair, Joni clung to a glimmer of hope, an aspiration to better her circumstances and reclaim her maternal role. In a matter of weeks, she believed she had found the key to her redemption. Enter Chuck Mitchell, a tall, charismatic, and seasoned American folk singer. More crucially, he represented Joni's best opportunity to reunite with her daughter. The devised plan involved relocating to Detroit and establishing a musical partnership. The envisioned path included accumulating sufficient resources to retrieve Kelly, paving the way for a blissful reunion. However, as the adage goes, the best laid plans often go awry. Joni and Chuck soon entered into matrimony, but the disparities in their natures surfaced swiftly. Joni, youthful, imaginative, pulsating with talent, found herself juxtaposed against Chuck, an elder statesman with a collegiate background and a penchant for tradition. Initially inconsequential, the glaring contrasts became increasingly pronounced. While Joni viewed the union as a means to an end, 
akin to her prior convenience-driven relationship, fate had other designs for this ill-fated alliance. Chuck Mitchell embodied various qualities, but the mantle of a commendable husband eluded him. Joni fondly reminisced about the moment she eagerly shared her latest composition, Both Sides Now, with him. His response, however, shattered her spirits. He wielded his words like daggers, reducing her to a sense of foolishness. Ironically, Rolling Stone would later hail the very song as one of the best composed. Chuck's coping mechanism was evident. He grappled with Joni's undeniable brilliance, a truth acknowledged by all. While Joni might have endured these subtle jabs, a cascade of other issues compounded her tribulations. Joni harbored dreams of reclaiming her daughter only for the fragile hope to crumble. The day arrived when she and Chuck returned to Kelly's foster home, cradling her in their arms. The shared moments highlighted the striking resemblance between mother and daughter. However, in a moment of heart-wrenching resolve, Joni made a fateful decision. She reluctantly affixed her signature to the papers relinquishing Kelly to her foster parents indefinitely, leaving behind only a cryptic file Bearing the inscription Mother left Canada for the U.S. to pursue a career as a folk singer, Joni shifted her focus to her music and the unraveling threads of her marriage. Attempting to immerse herself in her musical pursuits proved challenging. Despite her endeavors, Kelly's specter lingered in Joni's thoughts. Music, rather than serving as an escape, became a conduit for all her experiences both euphoric and harrowing. Through her lyrics, she bared the essence of her journey. While Joni technically guarded the secret of Kelly's existence, her compositions became an open book, an anthology of maternal emotions. She poured out song after song, each an unspoken ode to her daughter. Yet the subtle hints remained unnoticed by the world. Joni's secret endured, veiled within the lyrical tapestry she wove. Two years elapsed before Joni perceived the truth. Specifically, she recognized Chuck as her first major exploiter. Choosing to part ways with the man, she retained the surname but shed the roles of wife and half of a musical duo. Joni Mitchell emerged as a singular force, both as a woman and an artist, with her talents radiating even more brilliantly. The world beckoned, and she seized it with unwavering determination. By the close of the 1960 EUs, Joni reveled in the transformative zeitgeist, a revelation dawned upon her an acknowledgement with absolute exhilaration and a little fear that my life was not going to play out on the same traditional feminine timeline as my mother and grandmother's. Her rebellion manifested through new music, challenging gender norms, and exploring new romantic entanglements. The warning from Leonard Cohen's mother, advising Joni to be prepared to bleed, acted as an ominous forewarning. Ignoring the crimson flags, Joni found sparks flying when she encountered the older singer-songwriter in 1967. Although their romantic liaison was brief, the enduring impact of their musical influence persisted. Joni and Leonard found their happily ever after as friends. Regrettably, the same cannot be said for Joni's subsequent relationship. Contrary to the common adage, distance failed to nurture affection between Joni Mitchell and David Crosby. Initiating their summer romance in Florida, the allure waned when David ventured to visit Joni in New York City, emerging as unattractive in every way. A disillusionment unfolded as David engaged in clandestine affairs, reigniting a connection with an ex-girlfriend. Joni, far from impulsiveness, devised a calculated plan for reprisal. At a gathering attended by David, Joni unveiled her latest composition, the song about the midway. The initial enthusiasm of the audience gave way to comprehension as the lyrics unfolded a breakup anthem crafted for David. To underscore her point, she performed it once more, anticipating a specific reaction. However, the outcome diverged from her expectations. Joni's endeavor at vengeance was met with David finding the situation hysterically funny. Remarkably, he harbored no resentment toward her, acknowledging the awkwardness as inconsequential compared to his transgressions. David conceded that Joni was not only a legend, but also an immensely superior musician, a sentiment she substantiated time and again. In 1968, Joni Mitchell unveiled her eponymous debut album, marking the commencement of a groundbreaking career. Since then, she has released an impressive 19 albums, sold nearly 10 million copies, and secured 11 Grammy Awards. Joni stands as a darling of critics, an indispensable presence in lists of the best artists, songs, and albums. Her secret weapon lies not just in her pen, 
but in the vulnerability and openness she infuses into her music. Some caution against oversharing, but fans find solace in Joni's willingness to lay bare her experiences, even the melancholic ones that would soon punctuate her journey. In the year 1969, when Joni serenaded Graham Nash, it resonated as a harmonious duet of mutual admiration. Graham, an attractive singer-songwriter not only possessed musical prowess, but also a genuine kindness that endeared him to Joni. She entertained the notion that he might be the one leading to an engagement marked by affection. However, the specter of Joni's tumultuous past materialized as cold feet, casting a shadow over the potential fairy tale ending. Joni clung to a belief in a family curse, tracing a lineage of maternal discontent with marriage and motherhood. The vocalized discontentment of her mother perpetuated a cycle that extended through generations. Both grandmothers abandoned artistic passions for the constraints of matrimony and motherhood. Haunted by the fear of replicating their fate, Joni grappled with the looming prospect of entrapment and misery. The union between Joni Mitchell and Graham Nash while not impervious to typical disagreements, took a startling turn during a heated argument. Joni, in a moment of unconventional fury, poured a bowl of cornflakes and milk over Graham's head in the presence of a maid. Graham, revealing an unexpected twist, admitted to resorting to a physical reprimand. Classically, Joni parted ways with Graham through unconventional means. Known for her prowess in parting with people in unconventional ways, Joni's breakup with Graham took the form of a telegram in 1970. Bearing the cryptic message, if you hold sand too tightly in your hand, it will run through your fingers. Love, Joan. Despite the apparent finality, Joni's lingering feelings for Graham resurfaced when their paths crossed again. Joni Mitchell's attempt to maintain friendships with exes took an unexpected turn during a group boat trip to Panama with an ex-fiancé. Unaware that Graham Nash was part of the entourage, Joni found herself navigating choppy waters illnesses, inexperienced sailors, and strained relationships. The trip, intended as a balm for a failed engagement, morphed into a tumultuous journey that would provide ample material for Joni's songwriting endeavors. In the year 1971, Joni unfurled the iconic album Blue, a poignant tapestry weaving together the heartbreaks of her life, encapsulating her experiences with Kelly and Graham, revered not only as her magnum opus, but also as one of the paramount albums of all time. Blue stood as a paradox for Joni forged from pain, yet amplifying the blues that colored her existence. This period laid the foundation for her subsequent chapter. The year 1973 unfolded as a sequence of successive breakups for Joni Mitchell. It commenced with James Taylor, a troubadour whose struggles with substance abuse spiraled into turmoil. Seeking solace in Jackson Brown, Another singer-songwriter, Joni found herself entangled with a leering narcissist. Brown's transgression reached its zenith when he terminated their relationship, sparking rampant speculations. In the aftermath of Jackson Brown's departure, whispers of Joni's purported self-destructive tendencies circulated. One particularly damning assertion implied a brush with self-harm. Joni vehemently refuted these claims, dismissing them as unfounded fabrications. Defying the narrative, she affirmed her mental stability while embracing her distinctive brand of eccentricity. In the domain of Hollywood heartthrobs, Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson assumed dual roles as actors and charismatic figures, both captivated by Joni. However, their responses to her rejection followed divergent trajectories. While Jack gracefully embraced friendship, Warren's persistent pursuit, oblivious to Joni's aversion to complex entanglements, solidified his reputation as a renowned Lothario. Amidst the Hollywood whirlwind, Warren Beatty's dominance extended beyond the silver screen to a parade of women in the 1970s. Perplexed by Joni's resistance, Warren assumed her surrender was imminent. Little did he comprehend that Joni's reluctance stemmed not from playing hard to get, but from a desire to avoid tumultuous relationships. Yet, the pursuit of yet another connection awaited her. Enter John Guerin, a striking drummer who forged a connection with Joni through their shared passion for music. Their professional collaboration morphed into a perilous entanglement, intertwining their personal and artistic lives. Collaborating on music and embarking on a joint tour, they ventured into the perilous territory of blending business with pleasure, discovering the pitfalls that awaited. The fusion of personal and professional lives marked the inception of trouble. John's possessiveness reached a breaking point when Joni interacted with exes 
resulting in a destructive eruption of jealousy and suspicion. His revenge took the form of flaunting a new romantic interest in front of Joni while they continued touring together. The toxic blend culminated in a tour cancellation, a necessary break, and Joni channeling her anguish into melodic compositions. As 1977 ushered in a new decade, Joni Mitchell continued to grapple with dysfunctional relationships. Percussionist Charles Don Elias crossed the line, inflicting physical harm on Joni during a tumultuous relationship. After enduring four years and three beatings, Joni terminated the relationship, setting the stage for her encounter with her future husband. The year 1982 marked a pivotal juncture for Joni. Collaborating with bassist Larry Klein on her music, they not only became musical partners but also tied the knot. However, the union swiftly unraveled into a disastrous marriage. A pivotal moment arose when Joni, at 42, faced a risky pregnancy. Her refusal to amend her habits exacerbated the situation, leading to a painful miscarriage, with Larry seemingly oblivious to her ordeal. Thanksgiving 1992 unfolded as a tumultuous chapter for Joni and Larry. The aftermath of a miscarriage, professional conflicts, financial strains, and disappointment in their work laid bare the fractures in their marriage. Larry issued an ultimatum demanding change from both parties. Joni's response, a resolute refusal to alter her stance at that juncture, marked the conclusion of their tumultuous union. Back in 1995, the legendary Joni Mitchell faced an unexpected twist when an art school friend spilled the beans to a tabloid. The revelation wasn't about her chart-topping hits or artistic prowess, but focused on a well-guarded secret the daughter she had given away. The world now knew, and Joni found herself at a crossroads. Despite the betrayal, Joni found a silver lining. The public revelation allowed her to embark on a journey to find her long-lost daughter. Fate played its part as her daughter, Killerin Gibb, was simultaneously searching for her birth parents. The emotional reunion finally took place in 1997, marking a poignant chapter in Joni's life. The reunion, however, was not a fairy tale. Killer N, akin to her mother, carried her own set of challenges from school dropouts to financial struggles, mommy and daddy issues, and baby daddy drama. Despite their uncanny resemblance, the mother-daughter duo faced numerous differences, leading to frequent clashes. In the year 2000, a vehement disagreement reached a boiling point, leading Key Loren to report to the police that Joni had slapped her. This clash shattered the delicate bond between mother and daughter. Unlike previous disputes that found resolution, this time an enduring silence prevailed, leaving Joni bereft of her daughter once more. Yet, the familial ties proved resilient prompting Joni and Killerin to embark on the arduous journey of repairing their strained relationship. Amidst the complex tapestry of Joni's relationships, this one emerged as the most intricate and significant. Regrettably, it was not the sole facet of Joni's life in need of restoration. Joni's existence has been marked by a series of health battles, encompassing polio, a protracted smoking habit, substance use, a rare skin ailment, and the inexorable march of time. By 27, she bid adieu to tour and released her final album. However, retirement proved ephemeral as health challenges continued to cast a shadow over her. In March 2015, a startling revelation unfolded at Joni's abode. She was discovered unconscious on the floor, hurried to the emergency room, medical assessments and interventions unveiled a three-day untreated brain aneurysm resulting in paralysis at the age of 71. Joni's retreat from the public eye triggered concern among her devoted fans. However, in 2022, she defied expectations, surprising everyone with an unannounced appearance at the Newport Folk Festival at the age of 79. Joni elicited tears from the audience as she performed a set list comprised of her greatest hits. True to form, Joni Mitchell emerged as a singer, songwriter, and an enchanting force. What occupies Joni Mitchell's present? She is deeply engrossed in the production of a much-anticipated biographical movie about her life. Reflecting on heartbreaks, triumphs, and tragedies, she has found solace in it all, expressing, I would not change anything. I do not doubt that it unfolded as it was supposed to. Joni Mitchell's influence reverberates across generations and musical genres. A procession of iconic figures, including Prince, B.J. Ark, Taylor Swift, Bob Dylan, Annie Lennox, Jewel, and Neil Diamond, 
acknowledges her profound impact. Much like her life, the roster of artists inspired by Joni continues to evolve a testament to a legacy that transcends the constraints of time. How do you feel after hearing all about what Joni Mitchell went through throughout her life? It is no coincidence that her music has influenced and touched the hearts of music listeners of all generations. Please leave a comment about your opinion. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to like and follow me to see the next interesting videos.